Welcome back to our eight-part study based on Dr. Hugh Ross's popular book, Why the Universe is the Way It Is. Today, Dr. Ross is going to be talking about the Earth and what's so special about our little blue planet as opposed to all the other ones. As humans, we kind of like to think it's special because we're inhabiting it, which is true to a point, but there's a lot more to planet Earth's unique qualities that you may be aware of. I will warn you in advance to beware of flying chickpeas, but we'll give away nothing more. Enjoy session number four. If God made the universe, why is there an Earth? Let's begin by reviewing our last three sessions. If God made the universe, why is it so massive and vast? Uh, why is it so old? And why is it uh, so uh, dark? And, uh, you know, it must be that, well, the fact that the universe is so very massive and vast and that it is so old, as we've explained, testifies of God's great love and care for the human species. He did not consider it too great of an expense uh, to build a universe of 50 billion trillion stars, where that's only 1% of all the stuff of the universe, so that we could have a place to live, a nice place to live. Likewise, he didn't consider it too great an investment of time, 13.73 billion years of uh, intense creation activity so that we could have a nice place to live. So the universe is telling us just how high of a value uh, God places on the human species. And then we looked at the fact that God has placed us at the one time and the one location in the universe where we get to actually witness everything that God has done throughout uh, creation history. And so God made the universe to be discoverable by we human beings. In other words, his intent all along is that we would gain knowledge, not only about the universe, but about him and his plan for us. So again, this tells us uh, that we must have very high value and purpose in uh, God's sight. Uh, another way to put it into context, we can look at the universe and we can learn things, not only about the universe and about God, but about ourselves, you know, our place uh, in terms of God's standing uh, in his creation. And this is something that has not escaped the attention even of astronomers and physicists who are not believers. For example, we have uh, Freeman Dyson, one of our nation's most famous physicists, who wrote uh, several years ago in his book, Disturbing the Universe, the more I examine the universe, the more evidence I find that the universe in some sense must have known that we were coming. Namely, as we look at the universe, we can't avoid the conclusion that somebody out there was preparing and designing it for the entry of the human species. Paul Davies, an agnostic physicist, writes in his book, The Cosmic Blueprint, the impression of design is overwhelming. No matter where we look, uh, we see this overwhelming evidence for design, not just for the benefit of life, but especially uh, for the existence of human beings. If he created the universe with all of its features in physics, would it guarantee the future existence of a planet Earth? Now, many astronomers and physicists are saying that planets identical to the Earth must exist all over the universe. But we're now discovering through new discoveries, especially with our research on extrasolar planets and looking at what it takes to get a planet like Earth that can sustain advanced life, we're recognizing this is not going to happen. Even though the universe is exquisitely designed to make possible the existence of a planet like Earth, it's not going to happen unless the Creator intervenes personally beyond the cosmic creation event throughout the entire history of the universe to make it possible. When my astronomy colleagues speak about the anthropic principle, the idea that when we look at the universe, we see this overwhelming evidence of design for the benefit of human beings, they typically are referring to the universe as a whole. The truth is that when we astronomers study the universe at any uh, scale size level, we find that same overwhelming evidence for design. It's not just the universe as a whole where we see this case for design, we see it at all size scale levels. In other words, we need a just right universe, we need a just right cluster of galaxies, and we need a just right galaxy within that cluster of galaxies, and we need a just right star within that galaxy, and we need a just right assortment of planets to accompany our planet Earth, literally 
every planet in our solar system plays a critical role in making advanced life possible here on planet Earth. I hope when you celebrate Thanksgiving, you set up a word of thanks for Jupiter, Uranus, Neptune, uh, Mars, and Venus, in addition to, of course, this wonderful planet in which we live and the moon that orbits it. You know, over 20 different features of the moon must be exquisitely fine-tuned or designed in order to make advanced life possible here on uh, planet Earth. Now, Life is possible, advanced life is possible here on planet Earth, not just because of the way God designed the universe and orchestrated the history of the universe, but in particular, our star, our accompanying planets, and Earth itself. And astronomers now realize uh, that the sun formed in a very dense cluster of galaxies. Now, here's a gaseous nebula, a giant molecular cloud, and it's these giant molecular clouds that form stars. And we realized that uh, our sun formed in one of these gas clouds that very quickly generated a number of supergiant stars that throw off what we astronomers call wolf riot winds. You say, what is that? These are winds that are super enriched in short-lived radiometric elements, in particular aluminum-26, which means that our sun and our solar system was bathed in aluminum-26 radiation. Say, so what would that do? It drives off the volatiles. What are volatiles? Uh, gases and potential liquids. And so unlike other star clusters, uh, this particular cluster in certain parts of the cluster was bathed in such intense aluminum-26 radiation uh, that water was driven away, carbon dioxide was driven away, carbon monoxide, methane were driven away. We've talked earlier how our planet Earth is very poor in terms of its quantity of water and the gases. Well, partly it's because of where we were born and how we were bathed in this intense radiation. Then as we move a little bit further into the history of the star birth cluster for our sun, uh, the gas has now been collected into these stars and then many more stars are forming. Uh, but we now have the sun surrounded uh, by hundreds of stars, many of which are supergiant stars. We now know, for example, that the elements we see in the crust of the Earth must have come from three different kinds of supernova eruptions. There are different kinds of supernova. They don't all make the same elements. I mean, when you look at the uh, table of elements, there's, what, 92 natural elements. They come from different sources. Uh, some will come from a type 2 uh, supernova, some from a type 1 supernova, some a type uh, uh, 2b supernova. Others will come from what we call asymptotic giant branch stars. Others will come from uh, binary uh, stars. We have the whole lot. We have the whole lot because we have the good fortune of being born in a dense cluster of stars where we had just the right supergiant stars ending their lives and exploding at just the right time in the history of our emerging solar nebula. I mean, if the timing is a little bit too soon or too late, uh, you can wind up not being sufficiently enriched with these elements, or you wind up being obliterated by the explosion. The location and the timing for each of these enrichment stellar events was exactly right to give us the whole assembly of these uh, rare elements we see within the Earth. Now what I want to do for you here is show you what happened next. And I'm going to do a little demonstration for you here. Let me get this little uh, tiny thing here. And you know, our, we now know that our solar system was born in a cluster of at least 3,000, if not four or 5,000 stars. So I want you to imagine that these garbanzo beans I got here are stars. And I don't have three or 4,000 of them, but I'll put a whole bunch down here. So this gives you an idea of uh, what things were like. And it's really very dense collection of stars. And in the middle of all this, uh, we have our sun and its emerging system of planets. And it gets enriched by all these explosive events where they happen at just the right time and just the right place. And then something really amazing takes place. One or two or maybe three giant stars uh, get in sufficient near vicinity of our sun that it winds up giving our sun a huge gravitational kick. And what happens is, say, this little 
uh, thing that's our solar system gets kicked out like that and gets ejected at high speed out of the star cluster and winds up being in a safe zone, far from the birth star cluster, now all by itself out there where the star density uh, is uh, very uh, thin, which means that we're no longer in danger of being gravitationally beat up uh, by nearby stars. And so with the planets now forming and you know, God creating life here on planet Earth, uh, the kick out is long in the past, and so we're now uh, at a safe point. Now, because of the uh, aluminum 26, that lowers significantly the quantity of water and gases in our uh, planet. So Earth and the other solar system bodies uh, would have very thin atmospheres compared to what we'd see in other uh, planetary systems. In fact, now we're finding hundreds of planets outside of our solar system. And it's showing us just how volatile, poor, the planets in our solar system are. But as we look at Earth, it's exceptionally volatile, poor. I mean, we talk about Venus as our sister planet. Our sister planet has an atmosphere that's 40 times denser than ours. And we're the bigger planet. We're more distant from the sun. What that tells us is that when our solar system got kicked out into a safe zone, Earth at that time at an atmosphere a hundred times denser than it is right now, and an ocean that was probably a hundred times more extensive than it is uh, right now. Uh, but what I'm going to do now is show you a video clip uh, from our Journey Toward Creation uh, television documentary that we've aired a few times. Uh, just a short clip that shows you what happened in the early history of planet Earth uh, that took the already depleted volatiles water and gases in our atmosphere and depleted it by another factor of a hundred. So if you can uh, just take a look at this. Moon exploration enabled us to confirm that lunar rocks differed chemically from earth rocks. Through study of lunar rocks radioactive decay, researchers discovered that the moon is in fact nearly a hundred million years younger than the earth. In the 1990s, a theory explaining the moon's existence gained wide acceptance in the scientific community. According to this theory, an object the size of Mars crashed into the newly forming Earth about four and a half billion years ago. Most of the object's mass was absorbed by the Earth but this collision also sent up a huge cloud of dust and rocky fragments all around the Earth. In time, gravity pulled those fragments together into one solid body, the Moon. The Earth, meanwhile, lost its entire atmosphere, and a new, much thinner one began to form from gases released by the Earth's crustal material. Such a collision may seem a disaster, but it proved just the opposite. It set in motion certain alterations to Earth's features that eventually made this planet a uniquely suitable site for life. You know, unless the collider uh, had hit the Earth at just the right time, at just the right attack angle, at just the right velocity, with the Earth's primordial ocean of just the right depth and uh, just the right temperature, we would not wind up with a planet like we have today where we got water in just the right quantity in all three states, uh, frozen, uh, liquid, and vapor, where it remains stable for billions of years. The odds of this kind of collision happening by chance are staggeringly small, much less than one chance in a trillion, 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 trillion. What we're seeing here is dramatic evidence of God's intervention to make sure the collision took place in just the right way in order to set up the conditions uh, for future life here, uh, advanced life here on planet Earth. Now, that's not the only event that took place in the Earth's uh, past history that set up conditions for advanced life. This collision happened when the Earth was about 30 to 40 million years old. Uh, but there's an event that took place about 700 million years later called the Late Heavy Bombardment. 
and what's happening in the first few hundred million years of the history of our solar system is that Jupiter and Saturn were interacting with a large belt of comets and asteroids, the Kuiper belt, and both of them were drifting outwards, but Saturn was drifting at a faster rate uh, than uh, Jupiter uh, was drifting. It reached a point where Saturn was making exactly one orbit around the Sun for every two orbits of Jupiter. That's what's called a one-two resonance. It destabilized the solar system and caused a massive rush of comets and asteroids into the inner part of the solar system, and that's responsible for almost all the craters we see on the moon. In fact, that's one way that we, this research got started. We looked at the craters on Mars and Mercury and uh, uh, Venus as uh, well as our own moon and realized they all had the erosion signature that indicated a massive bombardment of the inner solar system about 3.87 billion years ago. Earth being the biggest of the inner solar system satellites took the most damage. We took 30 times the damage that the moon took. And that resulted in an infusion of sulfur and oxygen into the interior of the Earth, which proved to be critical for establishing a long lasting stable magnetic field which protected our atmosphere from being sputtered away from the sun and also played a crucial role uh, in uh, setting up uh, long-lasting, enduring uh, plate tectonic activity. And it also played a role in making sure that in the crust of the Earth, uh, we have all the elements we need to sustain advanced human civilization. So thanks to where our solar system was born and how it got kicked out of its birthing cluster, uh, thanks to the enrichment it got from the different supernova and the different asymptotic giant branch stars, thanks to the uh, moon forming event and the late heavy bombardment, Earth wound up with a set of elements we see nowhere else in the universe. In particular, we realize that our planet Earth, its crust, is loaded with what we call vital poisons at just the right level. What's a vital poison? A vital poison is an element uh, that um, if you have too much of it, it will kill you. If you got too little of it, it will kill you. It has to be at a just right level. Phosphorus, we all know, is essential for life. With, without phosphorus, you can't have DNA and RNA. But too much phosphorus in your diet will be deadly. Too little will be deadly. And one of the enigmas of planet Earth is it's phosphorus rich. It's four times richer in phosphorus than any other body in our solar system or any other uh, body we see uh, within our galaxy. And that's been a big enigma. How do we get to be so phosphorus rich? Well, these events explain that. Fluorine is another vital poison. And our planet Earth has 50 times as much fluorine in its crust than what we would expect for Earth-type planets. And fluorine, again, if you got too little, It'll kill you. Too much, it will kill you. Sulfur. Uh, we've been doing research on Mars, which tells us that Mars has got 60 times the sulfur in its crust that we have here in planet Earth, which is one reason astronomers are now convinced that Mars never had life. There's way too much sulfur. But sulfur is critical in our diet. If you don't have enough sulfur, you will die. If you've got too much sulfur, you die. We have just the right amounts. Now carbon, of course, we're all carbon-based life. What we realize is that our planet is exceptionally carbon poor. We have 1,200 times less carbon than what we would expect in Earth-like planets. And if we had as much carbon as what we're seeing elsewhere in these extrasolar planets, our atmosphere would be choking out the possibility of advanced life. Our atmosphere would be loaded with carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, and methane, uh, carbon gaseous molecules and our lungs literally wouldn't be able to function. Uh, we'd be choked out, let alone the air pressure problem we'd be facing. Likewise, we realize we're extremely nitrogen poor. Our atmosphere is 80% nitrogen, uh, but our planet is extraordinarily nitrogen poor. And that again is crucial for advanced life. Too much nitrogen, too little nitrogen, that's a problem. Now, this is a partial list. There's actually 22 vital elements that are in our diet, 22 different elements 
or if you got too little, you'll die. If you got too much, you'll die. And in every single case, Earth has exactly the right level, and that level is anomalous. We don't see it anywhere else. In addition to that, we have anomalous abundance of metals that are crucial for launching and sustaining human civilization. For example, uh, we have a huge amount of aluminum in the crust of the Earth. The crust of the Earth is over 7% aluminum. Aluminum is a valuable metal for sustaining human civilization. It's strong, it doesn't corrode easily, and it's very light. Another one that we're very dependent upon these days is titanium. Uh, if you want to fly in a safe aircraft, make sure it's got titanium in it. Uh, it's a little heavier than aluminum, but much stronger uh, than aluminum, uh, but much lighter uh, than uh, iron. And we've already noted that our planet is super abundant in uranium and thorium, 16,000 times as much uranium, uh, 23,000 times as much as thorium. You know, in the crust of the Earth, uranium is more abundant than tin and antimony. It's everywhere in the crust of the Earth. And this is what makes possible advanced life here. What do we see in Psalm 24, verse 1? The Earth is the Lord's and everything in it. God takes credit for the Earth's properties. It's not something that simply spontaneously comes out of the physics and the structure of the universe. It takes God's personal hand to make sure the Earth has everything it needs to sustain advanced life. Holy hummus, you guys. It was kind of like garbanzo getting there for a little bit. Okay, everybody's safe. So what did we learn? We found out that even the moon has to be perfectly designed for advanced life to exist on Earth. The Earth has unique enrichment from supernova explosions that no other planet in the universe has. And the Earth has just the right amount of vital poisons and metals to make intelligent life possible. Dr. Ross is building a very solid foundation for us here. In every session, he has shown us that the universe is optimally designed for human existence. The physics say it's virtually impossible for this to have happened by random chance. We are building a beautiful case for the existence of God here, and I'm so glad you're with us. Now, go ask your questions, make sure you get all the answers you're looking for, and I'll see you next time.